Can you imagine when we meet Jesus face to face? Mm. What a joyful day that will be. Mm. Yeah. I think I'll be laughing and crying at the same time. Mm. But that beautiful promise in this theme song, we're going to study today about making mm. all things new. That's God's yeah. promise. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it's been a great series looking through the Bible at life, death, resurrection, and eternal life. Today, as we study about making all things new, not us, but you making mm. all things new. May the Holy Spirit guide our study, but also fill our hearts with joy for the blessed hope that is ours to be with you for eternity. Guide us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 The Apostle Peter made a prophecy in his second letter, Second Peter. Uh, we're going to begin our study there. And Nicole, if you could read for us Second Peter 3 and verse 13. It's a wonderful promise. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And the Bible reads, But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Oh, I love that. That's a different, I've memorized it where righteousness dwells, but Nicole read from the New International Version, the, the home of righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. I love that. Think about a new heaven and new earth, but it says according to the promise. Can you think of anywhere in the Bible where there is a promise about mm -hmm. a new heavens and new earth? Or maybe, maybe Jesus just in a place not recorded in the gospel said to them, by the way, there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. Mm -hmm. Jason, there was an Old Testament prophet though, right? Yes. Where is that found? So Isaiah, the prophet, uh, says it in Isaiah chapter 65, 17. All right, let's take a look at that together. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. And I have the New King James Version here. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Uh, by the way, that's not Isaiah speaking, is it? That's the Lord speaking, right? Mm. And Isaiah mm. is recording the revelation that's being given to him as a prophet. Mm. Yes. Now, Peter, when he talks about the promise of a new heaven, new earth, the book of Revelation wasn't written yet, right? Mm -hmm. So he wasn't mm -hmm. reading from that. That was written after Peter's death. Yeah. But Pedro, let's see what uh, John is given in, in uh, Revelation from Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, which confirms uh, what we just read in the prophecy. Isaiah was, what, 700 years before the coming of Jesus. Yes. Uh, he promises even then a new heavens, new earth. How does John the Revelator uh, share that truth? I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Revelation 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Mm. So John in vision sees a new heaven and a new earth. Um, some mm. people think that uh, heaven's going to be like floating around on clouds, right? Maybe mm. if you're fortunate, you'll get a harp, so you have something to do <laughs> on the cloud. Uh, w what do you hear, uh, mm. Stephanie, from this, these words of the prophet John given by revelation from Jesus? Yeah, this is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's just, it's going to be different. The old has passed away. Different, but also... But also, it's still earth, heaven. It's, it's a lot of it's the It's a real place, thing. right? Yes. Yeah. Chavis? Yes. The fact that he says there's no more sea. He sees landscape, and, mm. and uh, he, of course, he's on the island, right? Where, right. Where he can't get out because he has no boat, right? You're and, talking about the fact that he's on the Isle of Patmos, yeah. a prison island. Uh, but still being given revelation from Looking Jesus. Looking forward to a time when he can just <laughs> no walk and that. visit his friends and visit with Jesus, probably. Mm. The key point I want us to note is that it's a real place. That's yes. right. uh, without the toxic waste dumps, mm. without all the corruption and death and cemeteries and hospitals, mm. right? Mm. It's a new heaven, the home of righteousness, as Nicole read. What are your thoughts? We're going to talk about God's promises to make all things new. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Lalika, about living in a new heaven, a new earth, where there's no more evil, no more sin, no more death, but where righteousness dwells? I think that uh, because we are so used to sin, mm -hmm. it's something that we cannot conceive. Uh, our mind is, cannot uh, 
grasp the idea that we will be in a place where we won't mm -hmm. suffer anymore and uh, uh, where nobody will be unjustly treated. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much pain, people being mm -hmm. raped and so forth. And you, you have this place where you're not gonna cry anymore. You're not gonna feel any pain. And everything is in harmony with the love, justice mm -hmm. of God. Wow. So it's amazing. I, yeah, what do you think, Jason? Well, I'm excited because God could say, well, you messed up this earth, so no more earth for you again. <laughs> but no, he's gonna give us, because there are still nice things about this earth, like nature and plants and relationships, and we get to still have all of that, but without the bad stuff. Mm, a place where righteousness dwells. Mm. We, we wanna know before the end of this study, you want to know how we can be in that place. Mm -hmm. We're gonna describe mm -hmm. it in some revelation that was given. There is, uh, a tabernacle that's spoken about in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 8, and when it comes to the new earth, it says God makes His tabernacle with us, but maybe a little different from what we read in Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, Nancy, if you could read that for us, it talks about a temple or tabernacle in heaven. I'll read from the New King James Version, and it reads, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, mm. a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Now, if you look back in Exodus, Moses was told to make a ta an earthly tabernacle mm. after the pattern mm -hmm. that he saw, right? And so you may be familiar with the tabernacle with the altar and with the holy place and the most holy place and the furniture in it. It was a picture of salvation. But apparently there was a tabernacle in heaven, and there is a tabernacle in heaven. Let's read about that in Revelation chapter 15. And Stephanie, if you could read the first eight verses of Revelation 15, it talks about the temple in heaven. Yes, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of gold of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you for your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and holding their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now, Jason, there's a lot of symbolism. We've talked about this in the book of Revelation, right? Uh, do you think this, there's some, maybe some symbolism even in this chapter with bowls and wrath mm -hmm. of God, but what about the temple? Does that seem to you to be symbolic or a literal place? No, that seems quite literal. It's talking not just about the temple, but even the activities that take place in the temple. Mm -hmm. All right, let's read a little more about the tabernacle in Revelation 7. Travis, if you'd read for us verses 7, th 9 through 17, um, we're going to get to ask the question about whether this tabernacle makes its way to earth or not. Um, when God says the tabernacle of God is with men. 
And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. After these things I looked, and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall, ne they shall neither hunger any more, nor thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes." Now we'll remember in a previous study that the redeemed, those who were dead and trusting in, in God's salvation, are raised when Christ returns. Yeah. The righteous living who have trusted Jesus as Savior yes. are caught together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always. ever or always be with the Lord. You've got the millennial yeah. judgment in heaven. One would assume it's during that time it speaks about the redeemed in the temple, mm -hmm. but now we're going to discover mm -hmm. that the redeemed will come to a new heavens and new earth. Let's read about that. I'm going to add one more verse, if that's okay with you, in Revelation chapter 21, because I want to focus on verse 3 and then ask a question. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, and I'm going to ask uh, Lavinia if you'd read that for us, because we hear a loud voice from heaven. Reading from the 21st century King James Version, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and mm. He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. <laughs> is that saying that the tabernacle that was in heaven or the temple in heaven came down, or is it saying God came down, uses the same word as in John 1.14, that He mm -hmm. pitched His tent, John 1.14, He tabernacled with us. Well, before you answer the question, I need someone to read Revelation 21 and verse 22. And uh, Lelika, if you could read that. John looks in vision, and uh, what does he see or what doesn't he see? Mm -hmm. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Revelation 21, verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Mm. In it, speaking about, about the new, the new, new heaven. earth, the new heavens yeah, the new and new earth, he doesn't see a temple because the Lord Himself mm -hmm. is the temple. So <laughs> I have a question. Some people say, well, I don't know. I guess we'll wait until we get there. But instead of a structure being the center of our worship, like in the Old Testament sanctuary, mm -hmm. what now is the center of our worship? Or should I say, who now is the center of our worship? Jesus. God Himself, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the center of our worship as we come to the temple of God. Um, someone says, well, maybe it's out somewhere, but the key point here is that we don't have structures that help us mm. to learn about what God is like. God Himself will be with us. Mm. 
yes. and be our God. Amen. He pitches his tent in our midst. Well, that raises another question for me, at least, is, and that is how how close will we be interacting with God mm. in the new heavens and new earth? And Pedro, if you could take us back to John 1 and verse 18, uh, where the Apostle John speaks, well, let's see what it says in John chapter 1 and verse 18. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, John chapter 1, verse 18. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the, bos the bosom of the Father, He has the sin uh, declared Him. No one has seen God at any time. Okay? Who's the only one who's seen God? The Son. Jesus. His Son, the only begotten of the Father, according to the text. Well, let's, let's pursue this, because doesn't it say somewhere, Blessed are the pure in heart? For they shall see God. First mm -hmm. Timothy, chapter six, verses fifteen and sixteen may help us. And uh, Enoch, if you could read that for us in First Timothy, chapter six, verses fifteen and sixteen, um, are we actually going to see God? He's going to make His home with us, mm -hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What do you read there in First Timothy six, fifteen and sixteen? Yes, and I'll be reading from the New International Version, and it reads, Which God will bring about in His own time, God the blessed and the only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To Him be the honor and might forever. Amen. How would you describe... Uh, I, 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 I see... Uh... Paul struggling for words to describe mm. the glory of God. Uh, how does he describe it? King of kings. Unapproachable. Unapproachable light. Um, mm. So will we actually see God in the new heavens and the new earth? Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, look at a few more Bible texts. Do you have the answer yet? 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. By the way, the good news is, there's a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells, right? Mm -hmm. And God Himself will be with us, and we will worship Him as God sought even during the time of the Scriptures in spirit and in truth. 1 John chapter 3, and uh, who'd like to read that for us? Nancy, verses 2 and 3, will we actually see Him face to face? Reading from the New King James Version. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed that we shall be what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Mm -hmm. You say, Derek, that seems to suggest that we will. <laughs> Pedro, let's look at one more verse in Revelation 22 verses 3 and 4. We're doing some detective study, and some of you say, Derek, I don't really mind how it will be. I'll just be happy to be there. <laughs> but this revelation is given to give us some insight. Like Jason said, it's a real place, right? This is a real mm -hmm. new heaven and new earth, a real holy city, a real descending of God to be with us. Mm -hmm. How does it read in Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4? I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, In the middle of the street, in the either side of the river, was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding to the fruits every month. The leaves of the tree was the f a healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servant shall serve Him. And verse 4. Verse 4. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. So here's the question. We know that the Father, wanting to fully reveal his character, mm. sent his only Son, mm. Mm -hmm. who came into humanity. You remember the words in uh, John 1, 14, and the Word 
became flesh and pitched his tent. There's that same word. Dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here's my question. We'll probably get a thousand emails on this one, and that's okay, because this is interactive, and we'll see what we come up with. So will we see the face of Jesus face to face in the New Jerusalem, the earth made new, when he, with the Father and the Spirit, come to make their home with us? Or will we see the Father too face to face? What do you think? Jason? Well, we don't necessarily know the physical form of God the Father. We know Jesus the Son since he was made, became a human. So it may be that the face of God in a physical form may be something a little different than just us as humans. So then the experience of what it means to see someone face to face may look a little different when they're not a human. There's still an inapproachable light, right? Yeah. Uh, though it did say, let us make man in our image, right. our image, right. after our likeness. Mm-hmm. Um, anybody else? What, what do you think, Travis? I think we'll see both of their faces face to face, you know, because um, as was, was talking here, it's talking about both thrones, the throne of God and the, the Father right. and the Son. And then it says we'll see his face and it goes on to say that we'll have his, his name in our forehead. So I believe... Uh, that we will see him face to face. What do you think, Lalika? I do also agree with uh, um, Travis. Uh, for what I know, the thing that separates us from seeing God is our sin. That's right. Ah. So if there will be no more sin, mm-hmm. so why not? <laughs> so, so are you suggesting the radical thought that we might actually be able to live in the midst of inapproachable light yes. mm. when we're in the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Pedro. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention, the Holy Spirit. We, have, we cannot forget Him because He's going to be abiding in us because that's what God gives us the, the ability to, to be in Him through the Holy Spirit. And we go, I believe through the text it says we'll be seeing the Father, the Son, and not like Satan look at the reflection of His, of his face, look upon Himself, we're going to look at our fraction and we're going to see the image of Christ's redemption in our lives. Well, someone's watching Hope Sabbath School today say, I don't know, Derek, but I guess we'll find out when we get there. But it says we will see his face, whether the his is referring to the lamb, who is the full revelation of the father's glory or the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. Actually, um, Jesus said, if you've seen me. You've seen the Father. I I don't know we have the answer to that, but it's going to be face to face, isn't it? It's going to be awesome. That's an American word, but we know what we mean by that. It's going to be an amazing experience to be in the presence of the Lord our God. Well, someone has said, I don't want to live forever. Uh, I have enough pain right now. But the new heavens and new earth, as Lilika pointed out, is going to be radically different from this world of sin. Uh, There will be, according to the scripture, no more tears. But before we get to talking about the place with no more tears, in a previous study, we talked about the millennial judgment. You remember that? Christ has come. The righteous living welcome him, but they don't go ahead of the righteous dead. They're raised and together they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Do you think during that millennial judgment, the wicked are all dead, the wicked dead remain dead when Christ returns, the wicked living, destroyed by the brightness of His coming, crying for rocks to fall on them, how tragic that is. God doesn't want anyone to have that experience. But do you think during the millennial judgment, Travis, you taught that study, do you think there'll be some tears? Mm. uh, According to the Bible, there will be tears, because if I have loved ones that aren't in heaven, Mm. Um, and, and I'm going to have questions, and the books are open, and I see that they rejected the love that Jesus had for them, I am going to weep. Mm. Because I love them, just as He did. I imagine He'll be weeping as well. Mm. And we'll be weeping, but when the judgment is closed, it's done, then that stuff will be put behind us. Let's look at a few verses that talk about those tears. 
uh, if you, if uh, you turn Lilika to Revelation 7, verse 17, and then uh, Tigist, if you'd read Isaiah 25, verse 8, uh, those books are written about seven, almost 800 years apart, and yet there seems to be a harmony there. Lilika, Revelation 7 and verse 17. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Mm. Thank you for smiling when you read that. <laughs> and you would say, Travis, that that happens at the end of the millennial judgment, or maybe after the executive judgment and the, crea the destruction of the final destruction of sin and evil? As personal as God is, Derek, I'm sitting here after we read this verse, I'm picturing even during that, He's sitting there wiping tears from our mm. eyes, because mm. that shows me a loving, compassionate God. Let's look at Isaiah 25 and verse 8. And Tigus, I think you're going to read that for us. Isaiah 25, again, seven, almost 800 years earlier, but, but listen to the words here. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Mm. The rebuke of His people He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Mm. So there's two wonderful promises, but we're going to go to one more. And uh, Lavinia, if you'd read it for us, the end of the book of Revelation talks about a new heavens and new earth, about a holy city coming down. Mm -hmm. And then would you read verse 4 of Revelation chapter 21? Let's see what uh, the Word of God tells us. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. How does that sound? <laughs> In other words, it's not just uh, mm -hmm. wipe away your tears, but there's still death and pain and sorrow, and He'll keep coming throughout eternity, wiping away our tears. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, is there an end to crying then? Is there a time when there will be an end to tears? I believe that. At least mm -hmm. tears of sadness, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, Pedro? Well, we see here the, the aspect of the millennium and the new earth. And I look into the millennium, and God's, God, one thing that we, we will take to heaven is going to be our character. And, and the character development, I believe, is going to be continuous through the millennium, because God wants us to renew us. And during that time, yes, we're going to be answering difficult questions. So how did I got here? We're going to be the sufferings and the things that God has done for us, and the choices, bad choices that we have made. We'll cry over them. People that we have lost, and probably cry for people who have come and we're wrestling how, how they are here. And God is going to allow us, I think, is, a, is, a, is going to be a, a therapeutic thousand years for the saints mm. because God is a God of healing and He wants to bring mourning mm. to a closure. And I think New Heaven, New Earth is going to be that moment that we're going to, you're going to be able to wipe away that year and says, now let's move forward and move on with our lives together in relationship. So I want to hold on to that thought and come to Tigist and Travis have their hands raised here that God is a God of healing. Mm. All right, can yes. you hold on to that for me? Let's not forget that we're going to come mm. back to it. We're now in a new heaven and new earth. Nicole read the home of righteousness, right? Mm. Where righteousness dwells. No more death, sin, crying anymore. But uh, Tigist, you want to reflect uh, on this time of no more tears? It's just the beauty of God's mercy and how God is a God of process and not just execution mm -hmm. of just wiping your tears and it's done. But he wants you to understand and take you through the process. And I, I think of death and grieving, you know, the process of you going through it and at the end you accept it and move on. And there is no chance for you to go back and dig into the pain all the time because all your questions were answered and God says it is done mm -hmm. and you move on. And I think it's just the beautiful gift of God to help us process all this pain that we have and just complete it for once and for all. And Amen. it's a beautiful thing. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing. We've got the God of healing and this process of healing. Yes. Travis? 
So I just couldn't help think, if this is a home where righteousness dwells, then that's right living, happy. You can't use the word uh, home of righteousness without thinking of happiness. So if, if, if we're living in a home of happiness, uh, then, then the tears cannot for, c continue forever. Mm. Enoch, can you read a text for us uh, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2? Because uh, we're talking about a God of healing and process. There's a very interesting uh, mm. reference there, or an insight given to John. Again, he's not just imagining. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to him about the new heaven and new earth. Yes, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. And it reads, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are the healing of the nations. Amen. Thank you so much for reading that, Enoch. Now, before we get to that last sentence, uh, how do you think John felt? He's on a prison island called Patmos, right? And he's seeing a river, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And what, how do you think, how was he reacting as he saw that? Would you like to imagine, <laughs> Stephanie? I mean, I, 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 know, I know how Daniel felt when he yes. saw these beasts and long times of persecution. It said he felt sick, right? He was weak. He, he was, his strength went out. How do you imagine John the Apostle, aged Apostle, felt as he saw this revelation? Unimaginable joy <laughs> and peace and, yeah, excitement, thankfulness, all of that. You know, I think Peter... I, the reference someone will send to us in First Peter. He speaks of a joy unspeakable yes. and full of glory. Mm. I don't know. I, you know, it's like, how, do I, how am I going to say that? Yeah. Uh, as he sees this, this revelation, mm. uh, the pure water of life. But I want to come back to the last sentence that Enoch read, because this is a perfect world, right? Mm. New heaven, new earth now. No sin, no death, no tears, no crying. So why would you need the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations? Mm. Hmm. Perfect world. Um, any, any ideas? The leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. You know, the correct answer is, I'm not sure, but I'll ask when I get there, mm. <laughs> right? Because we, doesn't Paul say, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Mm -hmm. But maybe we can, we can at least think about it, Jason. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Well, if I think of looking at the nations today, I see war, I see conflict, I see a lot of tension, a lot that doesn't look like mm -hmm. a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. So apparently there's something about the processes of the world we have now that God's going to have to do some kind of, dare I say, reconciliation, if you will, because there are tensions among nations and cultures and groups. And so there's a process. We've talked about this as a process. So maybe there's even a process when it comes to nations and culture. Hmm, that's an interesting thought. Uh, I don't know whether you were thinking we eat the leaves <laughs> for healing or we crush them like they do in some cultures, right? They beat the leaves into some kind of paste and put them on? Or, or is it the leaves are a canopy? We come to the tree of life and under the leaves as we come together, right? No more division. That brings healing. I don't know. Uh, help us out, Nancy and then Pedro. Well, God is a God of relationships. And so I agree with what Jason is saying. I think there's going to be a time to tie in what um, Tig has said uh, to process um, the conflicts that have been and to just come together in unity. So maybe we say to one who was once our enemy who's redeemed, thank you for your patience with me mm -hmm. during those difficult times, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, healing. Pedro? Well, one thing for sure I know that this leaf star not going to do 
yeah, they're not going to be made clothing for us because I know <laughs> it's going to be the tree of God mm. and He's going to provide the healing. It's not us mm. trying to provide, but He providing it. Now, Pedro, because some may not know all of the details, after sin, disobeying mm. God, our first parents tried to use leaves to, to cover the nakedness, mm. right? You're saying this is not to hide from God in any way. No. Yeah. This is something beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, take as you have your hand raised. You started our discussion. What do you think about these leaves for the healing of the nations? Well, as you said in the beginning, God had a provision for um, remission of sin, and that was Jesus coming to die for us. And it seems to me I'm just um, thinking aloud where now we have come from earth and we've gone through this experience and we need healing and reconnecting with God. I think as we say the process and we're talking about, it's like God giving us something to go to, like he gave his son Jesus Christ. I could be wrong. It's just a way of God giving us that way. The 12, I'm thinking of the tribe of Israel and something that God put in the in the garden for us to be healed. And it's just similar to God saying, my son will come and die for the, the sinful world if sin came here. Mm. So it's just a way. I'm just speculating. Well, can we agree we don't know all the details, right, mm -hmm. Lavinia? Uh, so I was only going to say, he says in His Word, Behold, I make all things new. All things new. He creates a new heaven and a new earth. He also creates and completes the healing by renewing our minds and our hearts and bringing healing to our minds and our hearts after mm -hmm. this experience on earth. Mm -hmm. And that may be a journey. It's a journey. That may be a process, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a beautiful one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, inexpressible joy, Stephanie, yes. uh, as we walk with that journey. Now, there was, uh, we heard earlier, I want to go back to verse 4 of Revelation 22. Jason, if you could read that for us. It, it did speak about, the, we'll see his face, and we discussed that. But the second half of the verse, uh, I'd like us to understand what that means. The New King James Version says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. So uh, the name of God, well, we know he, Moses was told, I am, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the Hebrews would write that uh, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. They would never say the name of God, right? But uh, that, that he says, I am. Um, is it possible that we will actually have some kind of name written on our forehead? <laughs> what do you think? Is that possible? Like a, I don't know, like a, a brand? Uh, what, Pedro, what's this talking about? Well, we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. When we look into the, the, the forehead in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we see as a symbolism of your, of your thoughts, of your thinking, your choices. The okay. frontal lobe is where, where choices are made. And God wants us, our character to be like His. And I think the name represents here God's character in our foreheads. We're going to reflect the image that He first created. All right. Anybody want to, to add to that? His name will be in our forehead? Anybody? All agreeing with Pedro? Jason? Yes, I, I think I do agree with him. And if you look back also to the other side, there's a, a mark related to called the mark of the beast that ah, the other people have. Ah. And it's not always just a physical thing, but it's also a mental experience or kind of a spiritual experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting with the mark of the beast, it can be in the forehead or in the hand. They actually believe it or they just comply. Mm -hmm. But uh, this name is, is in the forehead, yes. right? Yeah. It's It's... It's, but could that be related to what we talked about? We have the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. That we are now with all sin and yes. damage of sin gone, that we, we more fully, maybe in a growing way, more fully, in a growing way, reflect the beauty of the character of our Creator. Mm -hmm. Nancy? I think we'll be, there will be light shining from us 
as there was in the beginning with Adam and Eve until they sinned. And so I think um, the light that comes from God will be reflecting from us. It's going to be an amazing place and very real. And notice something else very interesting about this place. Lavinia, if you'd read in verse 5, actually there's two parts to the verse that are important. Let's look at the first half, if you would, the first uh, portion of Revelation 22, verse 5, down through the Lord God gives them light. And reading from the 21st century King James Version, and, and there shall be no night there, and they will need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. Mm. So, in the new heaven and the new earth, will there still be a solar system with a sun and a moon and stars? Or mm. uh, is it going to be a restoration of the original creation? Uh, what is it saying when it says that there will be uh, no night there? Mm. Any ideas? Is there still a 24-hour cycle? Are things radically different? What do you think, Travis? I think that there is uh, definitely a 24-hour um, cycle just because I've read in different places that there'll be the Sabbath will be kept mm -hmm. in heaven. So Good. there's this seven-day cycle, which would imply then that there's a 24-hour cycle. Of course, I don't know, you know, but if, we, if it's the earth created new, why wouldn't it be the same? Sure. Uh, but the fact that there's no night might seem to imply that we won't get tired at least physically tired anymore and even need rest. I don't know. But I know one thing, that Jesus was the light of the world. And when we dwell with him, mm. maybe there is, he was also the son of righteousness who would rise with healing in his wings. So, you know, maybe it's the light of Jesus, you know, that we're dwelling with, you know, and so we don't need it. Have you ever in, uh, in a, uh, maybe you've seen in a city setting where there's so much light that you don't really know whether it's day or night. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just so much light. Uh, we're talking about light uh, that's, uh, how did it put it earlier, uh, unapproachable light, mm -hmm. yeah. the glory of God, um, <laughs> that when we are in God's presence, there is no night there, is there? Mm -hmm. Pedro? Uh, that's what I was going to mention about the unapproachable light. God is going to be there with us. We just learned that. So we don't need the light of the sun. God's light is going to shine brighter yeah. than the sun. Even though the sun might be there, it might just be another star. You know, like we have the night star, uh, a closer star. But the light of God will be mm. guiding our earth and our paths forever. Inexpressible joy, mm -hmm. being in the presence of God. But that last part of verse 5, um, I want us to focus on. Lalika, if you could read that last part. Revelation 22 and verse 5, not only will there be no night there, for the Lord gives them light. What does it say at the end of that verse? Mm. And they shall reign forever and ever. Mm. They shall reign forever and ever. Now, we are in the presence of the ruler of the universe, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And if I understand correctly, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, right, who made us in their image, mm -hmm. ruler of the universe, why mm. would they need us to reign with them? Mm. Mm. Uh, we're certainly not taking their place, right? No, That's no. what Lucifer <laughs> wanted to do. I will be like the Most High. Um, but it says, they shall reign forever and ever. Travis? Well, I'm thinking of the Laodicean church, those who, who overcome are promised to sit on the throne. So this is a consistent theme in Scripture. And it's not that God needs us to reign. It's a privilege He grants to us to reign with Him. And then I was thinking about this and thinking all the things that Satan wanted. Ah. He actually gives to the redeemed of the earth. And I thought, no wonder Satan hates us. Of course, that's not um, to be like the Most High in the sense that we want to be the ruler, but we would have the mind of Christ mm. and love and a rule and reign with God forever. And that's something that Satan had wanted. And doesn't it say, as you mentioned, that, uh, that we will be seated on the throne? Uh, on the throne. Uh, Tigist? 
That reminds me the humble words we teach children in sharing. For me, God is very fair, oh, and sure. He has <laughs> gifted us this, not for Him to sit and rule over us, but to say, I, I love you so much that I want you to experience this. And so he puts us at that point where, uh, like Travis said, the privilege to enjoy that, not just to be the God who we he needed worship and adoration, but for us to even experience that level of, I don't know what to call it, but it's just glory and, and, and bliss. And just to sit mm -hmm. with him there, it's just the love of, God that is infinite that He wants us to share. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to come to that text. I was just looking uh, in Revelation chapter 3. And Travis, could you read it in mm -hmm. verse 21? You, you paraphrased that verse, but it, it's really quite amazing. We're not only living in the presence of the glory of God, but uh, let's read the promise that was given at the end of the message to the Laodicean church. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my mm. Father on his throne. Mm. Mm. We've we just got a few minutes to wrap up our study. Behold, I make all things new. Mm. Pedro, what thought comes to your mind here? <laughs> We're reigning with God. Mm -hmm. Moves over a little. I mean, I don't know if that's literal or not, but it's just amazing that he's wanting this eternal, intimate relationship with us, right? Well, just sure as it comes to my mind, restoration. God is restoring what he initially gave on, on the beginning. We, he gave us dominion of this earth. Now he is wanting to rule with us in a loving relationship. You know, as a married man, I like to rule the house with my wife mm -hmm. and I see God as we as his bride he's saying let's rule this world together mm. and and I guess I'm struggling with that and yet because all things are made new and we are now reflecting the beauty of his character he can trust us mm. Mm. to sit with him wow. on his throne after all that this universe has been through now beating in harmony once again. Travis? It only makes sense to me in this context that no one will understand love and mercy more than the redeemed from this earth. Mm. And God will know for sure that He can trust His redeemed children. Amen. Because we have seen the full revelation yes. of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. Mm. And our only desire will be to say, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God yes. Almighty. Mm -hmm. Just and true yes. are your ways, O King of the Saints. Mm -hmm. Friend, as we close this series, I just want to appeal to you and to tell you that God wants you to be with Him forever. Yes. He's going to make all things new. And by faith in Jesus and the provision of salvation, mm -hmm. you can experience eternal joy, inexpressible joy. A growing experience, yes. Reflecting more fully the beauty of His character throughout eternity, yes. But in a place where righteousness dwells. Mm. Yes. Will you trust Him today? Will you call out to Him today? Or if you've walked with Him many years, will you say again today, God, thank you for your salvation for me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a blessed hope. But what great love, mercy, and grace you have shown. We want to say we trust you today. We thank you today. We rejoice in your salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thanks for joining us for this series. Oh, write to us and tell us how you've been blessed. SSHope at HopeTV.org. And then rejoice in the Lord today and go out with the truths you've learned and be a blessing to those around you.